Well, we made it. We have finally reached the last entry in the Depth Heaven franchise. The last episode, episode 5, I mean episode 9 because Shinichi Ito is an absolute madman. Gungnir, Inferno of the Demon Lance, and War of Heroes, which is an insanely long title that no one calls it by, is the last official game in the Depth Heaven mainline series. It's a game that pretty much had everything going against it. It was released super late into PSP's life cycle. It came out in 2011, which is not only seven years after the initial release of the console itself, but also only five months before Sony was set to release their brand new console, the PS Vita. This situation was even worse in North America, as it came out on June 12, 2012, four months after the PS Vita was released, and I'm not even going to mention the PAL region since they got that even later. If that wasn't enough, Gungnir somehow manages to be the most normal looking out of the four at first, but is probably the most difficult game to truly comprehend. So it's no surprise that considering all these factors, Gungnir was practically dead on arrival. For those who've played the game though, they know that what lies underneath is a truly fascinating spin on a tried and true tactics formula. I can safely say that Gungnir is the most unique tactics game I've ever played. It's the only tactics game I can think of where you and the enemy are playing by fundamentally different rules. One that eschews many traditional ways of thinking that we tend to have when it comes to these types of games. While I do still think the story in Knights of the Nightmare is certainly told in a much more interesting way, Gungnir is probably the most conventionally compelling tale, even if I do have some reservations about it, which I'll get into. If Yggdra Union was a surprisingly nuanced story about war, then Gungnir takes that concept and goes way harder into it. It's a story of discrimination, of misunderstood intentions, and ultimately is a very human tale from beginning to end. Gungnir tells the story of Gilio Rago, a youth born in the peasant district of Espada. While there is probably a greater world out there, the entire setting takes place in the Empire of Gargandia in the year 983. The nation is home to two distinct classes, the noble Datania and the accursed Leonica. Exactly when this discrimination began to occur is left intentionally vague, but by the current year, it's basically become a fact that everyone in the Empire knows about. In order to further segregate the two races, the Leonikins are all stuck in the slum district of Espada. Because of this and uh, plenty of atrocities that have occurred like the Espada Massacre, the Leonica and some of the Daltania sympathetic to the cause have joined together to form the resistance group known as Esperanza. Unfortunately, they are completely outmatched by the far superior Imperial Army forces. Fifteen years after the birth of Esperanza and the death of Ricardo, Gulio's father, Gulio is about to be killed in a desperate battle when the demonic lance known as Gungnir falls onto the battlefield, giving the resistance a chance to prevail against overwhelming odds, pushing Gulio into the spotlight and forcing the wheels of destiny to start turning. It's pretty clear that with every subsequent game in the Depth Heaven franchise, the storyline has somehow managed to get darker and darker with every entry into the series, and I think Gungnir stands at the tail end of that. It isn't as bleak as Knights of the Nightmare as that plays out more like the aftermath of a tragedy, while Gungnir is entirely in the process of one. The ultimate resolution for Gulio and Alyssa's journey, no matter whichever path you end up in, is one constantly full of danger and one that has no easy answers. I mentioned this earlier, but if Yidra Union asks a question about what does war mean for two opposing nations, then Gungnir goes deeper and asks, why does distortion exist among communities, and why do people end up discriminating against those that are just like them? Even though the crux of the story is a downtrodden populace rebelling against the evil Nobos, the circumstances surrounding this conflict pose both sides into much murkier waters. While the Gungnir in essence plays a similar role to Yggdra's Grand Centurio, as they both act as a rallying cry for their armies, as well as a symbol of hope for the fight, I think Gungnir's integration to both the story and gameplay is far more effective. The Inferno or War Gods that are wielded by Gulio is such a cool concept. The fact that this power is explicitly not a force of good or justice, but rather pure power, and how it indiscriminately wrecks everyone on the battlefield. It's only from Gulio and Esperanza's point of view that Gungnir looks like a weapon of justice, while in the enemies and the players' eyes, it's clearly an evil, life-sucking scythe. Even with this weapon in hand though, Gulio, Alyssa's, and Esperanza's conflict against the Empire is still really one-sided all the way till the end. Speaking of which, let's run over our main characters. 
The protagonists for the story of Gungnir are Gulio Rago, son of Ricardo Rago, the previous leader of Esperanza, Alyssa, a noble child picked up by Gulio near the beginning, Ragnus Rago, a Daltan, adopted child of Ricardo and the current leader of Esperanza, Elise, a Valkyrie from Asgard who's only there to help Gulio as he's a wielder of Gungnir, and finally Paolo, the kind wise old man who acts as a surrogate father to the three Rago children. While at first it sounds similar to the setup for Yggdra Union, the noble Alyssa teams up with the rough and Gulio, the story is way different. The main character role isn't just shared between the two leads, but rather between the four leaders, Ragnus, Paolo, Gulio, and Alyssa. The most important relationship truthfully is between Gulio and Ragnus, the two brothers who aren't connected by blood, but rather by family. I won't get into too much detail here as that would reveal too much, but I will have a spoiler section at the end of this to talk about my in-depth thoughts on the full story of Gungnir, as well as the direction Shinichi Ito ends up taking with the game, as it's fairly impossible for me to talk on any sort of level without spoilers. What I will say is that despite the things revealed in the developer interview, which I'll get into, I still think the end product of Gungnir tells a story that might not be conventionally fulfilling, but one that stays true to the themes Gungnir wants to convey. The relationships between each of the characters are fairly fleshed out, yet still obfuscated, by how the game chooses to present its narrative, you truly do feel the desperate struggle that faces Gulio and the rest of Esperanza. As much as I enjoyed Gungnir's story, the gameplay is where this game truly shines. Gungnir manages to somehow be the most normal looking out of the four Depth Heaven games, yet is actually the most complicated and nuanced one out of the lot. Yes, it's a tactics game and has all the hallmarks of one where you control units on a grid in a turn-based combat, with elevation, back attacks, side attacks, but Pretty much everything else is different. It's a game that truly puts the word tactics to the test. In Gungnir, smart gameplay triumphs over any sort of grinding or farming as, while there are levels in the game, they don't nearly make as much of an impact as equipping the right weapons and characters for the right situations. As with most Depth Heaven games, there are a ton of different factors to juggle when it comes to combat, and while I won't be going over all of them, I'll try to hit the big ones so you can get a good idea of just how unique Gungnir truly is. Probably the most obvious difference compared to most tactics games is that fundamentally the players and the enemies are playing on different rules. While the enemies get the classic tactics treatment where all the units have separate turns that are dependent on their speed, all of the player units share a single turn. Abilities still have cooldowns with bigger abilities of course having bigger cooldowns, and forcing a character to move when they aren't ready yet penalizes that unit's max HP for that battle, and even subsequent battles which can only be healed by not using them or by using special items. It's such an interesting concept that really changes how players tackle every battlefield. You can't just move all the units up like in a normal tactics game as you won't have enough time to maneuver all your units and react to coming situations. A well-placed AoE is actually a huge threat, as trying to move all the characters out of the way is pretty much impossible before it goes off. It also makes the fact that you are massively outnumbered in every battle all the more pressing, as it's quite easy for enemies to overwhelm your comparatively lower amount of units. Just this one difference alone changes the entire landscape of the battle. Combine that with the fact that there is instant death all around the corner, such as units getting pushed off the map, drowning in the river, thrown off a cliff, and every move in Gungnir becomes just that much more important. Even equipping units in Gungnir is a whole nother ordeal. It isn't just about putting whatever has the highest stats, but rather choosing items for the build you want to go for. Gungnir is a ridiculously powerful weapon, but it also weighs an absolute ton, and if you field Gulio with it every battle, he won't be able to do much of anything in most fights. Every piece of equipment has a different weight limit, but it's also not just about trying to fit in as much as possible before you reach the 100% limit, as the more weight you have, the more time it takes for your character to make another action without penalty. Balancing all of these positive and negative factors when it comes to outfitting your units really forces players to sit down and think how to outfit each character for each particular battle. And I haven't even begun to talk about elemental and specialty affinities, tactic buffs, counter boots, and all of that nonsense. What's also cool is that while each character has their own class, you can really drastically change the build of each character just by swapping in and out weapons and armors, so you are free to alter most characters completely at will without having to waste too much time building them back up again. While you could stick with the story characters as the game gives you just enough space to field most of them in every battle, you also free to completely ignore them and just recruit a ton of generics and play the entire game with them instead. 
Want to run an all priestess party? Sure, the game's probably still beatable as long as you know what weapons to use and master. The War God summon system with Gonir is also really dang cool. I like the fact that they stay in line with the idea of how uncontrollable the power of the gods truly is. The War Gods chooses the targets pretty randomly but with a slight lean towards how badly your side is doing. That just like how the resistance is relying on outside powers they don't truly understand because of how desperate they are, the player should also only utilize the war gods when their backs are to the wall as well. The beat and TP system adds an additional layer of depth on top of everything we've already covered. Balancing TP is an integral part of the game and the beat system which utilizes that resource is fantastic at making players really think about their positioning alongside the whole passing turn system. Gungnir is a truly wonderful game that is kind of hampered by one annoying problem, and that problem specifically is the difficulty. For those of you who've watched my look at Reveria, this will sound familiar, yet the problem is completely different. Unlike Reveria, where the game is just kind of too easy in general, Gungnir's issue is that its two initial difficulty settings are both a bit too extreme. The basic difficulty is a tad bit too easy. It's not so easy that you can just completely ignore every mechanic and just throw your main character at everything, but it could definitely push the player a lot more, which would force them to utilize the crazy amount of mechanics in the game. It is still the difficulty I recommend for anyone playing Gungnir for the first time though, because the alternative, the advanced difficulty, entirely expects the player to have already mastered every single mechanic. If you don't understand how to build a decent character, what weapons you can master early on in order to have access to status effects, what even is the beat system and how to maximize the environment to your advantage, you aren't going to beat any of the stages past the halfway point. I know this because I was someone who went through the first playthrough on advanced difficulty and it was not a pleasant experience. Gungnir really could have used a difficulty in between basic and advanced, a uh, normal difficulty if you will. It would really help out the players who only tend to play games once. As it stands, I recommend that for first timers, they start Gungnir on the basic difficulty and if they find that too easy by the halfway point, then just restart onto the advanced difficulty. Gungnir is a game that does lend itself to multiple playthroughs, but that's not because of the story, but rather because of the depth of gameplay present. The game has two endings, but nearly the entire game leading up to the ending is exactly the same. So the only reason to be doing multiple playthroughs is to experiment with different team compositions, or to challenge yourself on a higher difficulty. If you play the game smart enough, you could prevail with just about any team composition you could think of, and the advanced difficulty warrants enough of a challenge that if you want a game that really pushes you, then Gungnir serves to scratch that itch. At this point, I think I've talked about everything I could about Gungnir without getting to the spoiler bits. Before I get into that though, seeing as this is the last game in the Depth Heaven franchise, not including the spin-offs of Jigjo Union like Blaze Union and Glory Union, I figured I'll include my overall thoughts about the entire franchise right here. Depth Heaven is a series of games that is easily characterized by one word. Unique. Sting has tried to push the envelope of what they could do with each game. While Reveria was fairly tame for the most part, every single subsequent entry has tried to completely revamp their game system, which is probably what I appreciated most about the Depth Heaven franchise as a whole. It was incredibly fun following this franchise way back when Yidra Union was being released. It gave me something to look forward to when starting each new entry, like what would this game end up doing? What kind of crazy system will Shinichi Ito try this time? What would the story be like? It's great when the next entry in a franchise is an improved and better version of the previous game, but I think it's far more interesting when the new entry just throws out everything we've known beforehand and aim for something completely different. Another part about the Death Heaven franchise that I really loved was the difficulty in their games. In a world where video games have constantly tried to lower the skill floor in order to be as accessible to as many people as possible, the Depth Heaven franchise wasn't afraid to offer a challenge in all of their games. Yes, some of them have easier difficulties for those who are just there for the story, such as Knights in the Nightmare, but for those looking for a challenge, the experience is there waiting to be had. The intricate systems in each of the games were fun to engage with because they offered a good reason as to why the player should bother with them since they're gonna get the ever-living stuff and kicked out of them otherwise. For those of you who've watched all of the previous parts of this retrospective, you'll know that this series can be rough in places. Many of them run into the same issues, the tutorials are not the greatest, 
there's a huge amount of information that the player needs to play the game as best as they can, and usually it's just not provided in a reasonable fashion. And sometimes, the secrets are a little too hidden for any sane human being to find them. Knights and the Nightmare had that ridiculous trap door, and Gunnir is also a prime example of this, where the secret ending requires fielding Alyssa in every battle without letting her fall once, which is impossible for the player to know in any aspect. I didn't even bother mentioning the tons of hidden items in every single battle that the player would never find normally, or the annoying treasure chest system present. I was never really a fan of the whole percentage upgrade system which started being implemented the last two games. Seems like an unnecessary hassle, especially when they happen during intermission where you can save, which seems to just promote save scumming. There are a lot of tiny things such as this that kind of bother me in every game. What makes Depth Heaven worth experiencing beyond all these tiny nitpicks, however, is just how unique of a game each one truly is. They may not be the most polished games I've ever played, nor are they the most accessible, but what I can say is that each and every entry is memorable in its own unique way. Even over a decade and a half since I first played this franchise, I still have a soft spot in my heart for these games. I would have loved to have seen a future entry in the franchise, to see where Depth Heaven decide to head next after all the craziness they've already shown, which is probably never going to happen. Glory Union, Knights of the Nightmare, and Yidra Union got a Switch remaster, so it's not impossible, but something tells me Shinichi Ito isn't working for the company anymore. Anywho, if you've got anything you want to talk about for Gungnir or any of the Depth Heaven franchise, feel free to do so down in the comments below, and I still got spoilers to talk about for Gungnir, so for those interested, feel free to stick around. Okay, so now that the only people left here are those who A, already played it, or B, just want to hear me talk more about the game, let's talk about the big elephant in the room. I mentioned during this entire retrospective that I actually kind of like the story in Gungnir, and I would probably be the odd one out because generally people don't have the best opinion of the story. I do understand why people think that way though. Even before reading the developer interview in the Gungnir art book, it's pretty clear that at some point in development, the story took a massive change in focus. It's why plenty of plot points in Gungnir just kind of fall by the wayside. All the supernatural elements like Gungnir, the war gods, at least the Valkyrie sent from Asgard, all of that is left pretty much entirely unexplained from beginning to end. As instead, the focus is shifted entirely onto the more human side of Gungnir with Gulio, Elissa, Paolo, and Ragnus. We never do find out why Gungnir appeared in front of Gulio. The only important part about the spear is that it allows Esperanza to fight back, and it forces Gulio to act as the figurehead for the rebellion. It also acts as the big impetus that reveals the crack in the relationship between Ragnus and Gulio. The two brothers' relationship is probably what drives Gungnir's story as a whole. One of the amazing things that Gungnir does well is that the entire story is portrayed from the point of view of Gulio as he is the main character. So from our point of view, we aren't really privy to many of the details surrounding each character up until later in the story. Ragnus, from Gulio's point of view, is the brother that he's incredibly proud of. Competent, smart, kind, cool-headed, and a leader that everyone looks towards. He's such an amazing guy that Gulio has kind of developed an inferiority complex and is content to follow in his brother's footsteps. It's why when the spear appears, Gulio wholeheartedly embraces it as he believes this is his chance to prove himself to Esperanza, the organization his father left behind, and his brother. What Gulio never really sees until it's too late is the fact that while he always thought of himself as inferior, Ragnus wrestles with these thoughts all the more so. He always felt the fact that he was not a true child of Ricardo unlike Gulio, but rather adopted during the Spada massacre. He has also faced much criticism from those in Esperanza for being Dautan, that even though he's poured his entire life into fighting for the Leonica, the very same people tend to look down upon him. These problems are then exasperated when Gulio becomes the figurehead once he attains the Gungnir, and people begin to disrespect Ragnus even within earshot. All of this, including Paolo, is what ultimately drives Ragnus to go against Gulio and Esperanza near the end once he finds out his true origin as Dautan royalty. Paolo is a similar story where Gulio and subsequently Wida players view him as a jolly old man, the wise mentor figure, and a parental substitute for the Rago children. What we don't see, even really until the end, is the way that Paolo kind of manipulates Ragnus, where he's the one who proposed to capture the child prince and raise him as a weapon to use against his father. 
Paulo is probably the one who pushed Ragnus to become the leader, and it's that betrayal among other things that leads to Ragnus standing against Gullio at the end. As for what happens afterwards, the game doesn't really show, which is what a lot of people don't like about this ending, although it's implied that he became the new Astro Hare after killing the Emperor. Elissa is interesting as well, while she has many parts to her that are similar to Yggdra, even down to the point that both of them are royalty and their ultimate goal is to retake the country, Alyssa is probably the more nuanced character. While she still has the whole innocent noble princess thing, she's the one who understands the intricacies of the Garganian politics more than any of the other main characters, and she's also the one who teaches Gulio that there's a whole lot more to obtaining rights for Leonica, aside from just swinging around a mythical godlance. Elise is the last main character. That said, again, she kind of gets shafted by the fact that it feels like at one point, she was meant to be much more integral to the plot, but thanks to the shift to focusing on the human side of Gungnir, she's just kind of there hanging alongside Gulio and the rest of the party the entire time. At the very least, her deadpan self wins the award for being the cutest member of the cast, so she has that going for her. I think the dynamic between the cast is easily the best out of the entire Depth Heaven franchise as a whole. Now, the other reason why people tend to look unfavorably towards the story of Gungnir is most likely due to the fact that the story doesn't exactly have a satisfying conclusion. For the law ending after beating Zayad, Alyssa reclaims the throne while Gulio and the rest of the Esperanza gets thrown into prison. In the chaos ending, Gulio assumes that Alyssa has betrayed them and leads Esperanza to escape. Afterwards, he's seen trying to plot the next rebellion against the current Empress. However, in the law ending, Gulio trusts in Alyssa and ends up being thrown into jail. They eventually do get to leave thanks to Alyssa, but there isn't this big celebration or anything. They don't even get to meet Alyssa now that she's the Empress and is in a position that they can't ever hope to touch. Robertus, the strongest man of the Empire, one of the biggest driving forces for everything that happened, the guy who killed Ricardo, Gulio's father, and the one who forces Alyssa to throw Gulio in jail, is still perfectly alive right next to Alyssa. While he's only doing what he considers best for the Empire as a whole, it doesn't help the fact that nearly every player probably hates him for all the strife he caused throughout the entire game. If you meet the special requirements for the Law Plus ending, we get a cute extra cutscene where Alyssa finally gets to see Gulio, and everyone just hangs out and has a warm meal together, which is nice. While we don't really learn anything further about Gungnir and Elise is just kind of hanging around because she likes the crew, I guess. I think the ending does stick to the themes that Gungnir is trying to convey, that bring the change to the Empire isn't something as simple as taking down the top dog, but rather something that comes about gradually and slowly. After the huge revolution, nothing really big has changed, yet, with the key word being yet. A magic spear won't mysteriously solve all the problems that are already present, as it is humans first and foremost who have to take matters into their own hands. The game ends with Alyssa giving Gulio a regal cloak, and then offering him a position of royal guardian knight. However, Gulio declines this in favor of helping those in the front line, hoping to exact changes there rather than being around someone he cares about. They reaffirm to stay friends no matter what happens as the scene fades to black. It's a touching scene that I think ends the game nicely, even if it isn't what all the players hoped would happen at the end. Can you believe I initially thought I could finish all of this Depth Heaven retrospective in two weeks? Yet, here we are almost three months later. I already did my whole spiel about the Depth Heaven retrospective as a whole, so all I'm gonna say is that if you like what you saw, all the supporter stuff is in the same place as always, like subscribe notifications, and especially hit that notification all buttons to get notified when my next video comes out. As now I'm finally done with this retrospective, I can jump into all of the other games I've wanted to talk about. With that, I'll see you later, till next time!